Good morning, good morning, and good morning, Sunday School class. I am excited about being here to teach another day. This is another day's journey, and truly, I am glad about it. Today is Sunday, July 19, 2020, and we are in our summer quarter, Unit 2, and Unit 2 speaks of wisdom in the gospel. I'll be using the Thompson Press International Sunday School lesson, and for the Bible, I'll be using the King James Version. Our title of today's lesson is The Wisdom of Jesus, and the adult topic is Wisdom that astounds and offends. Our scripture lesson for this morning is Mark, the sixth chapter, verses one through six. Our key verse is Mark, the sixth chapter, verses two and three. Our background scripture is Mark, the sixth chapter, verses one through six, and the seventh chapter, verses one through 23. Wisdom. We should all know the definition of wisdom. Wisdom comes from the root word wise, and we are to make wise decisions. We have the ability to judge correctly. And wisdom is the spirit given ability such that we can see with discernment and view life as God perceives it. God is the source of all wisdom. True wisdom comes from God. And the Bible says, if a man lack wisdom, let him ask God. We have two aims for our lesson today. One aim is to identify the reason why the people of Nazareth could not accept the wisdom with which Jesus spoke. And we, for number two, are going to commit ourselves to accepting the word of Jesus, even when his word challenges us in our lives. So our lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark. Mark is the writer of the text. It's the second book of the four Gospels. It's the shortest one of the four Gospels. And Mark aims directly at the life, the ministry, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He exposes a contrast between the faith of some and the disbelief of others. Mark begins this Gospel message with the ministry of John the Baptist. And then he teaches on the baptism of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus. And then as we start reading the chapters, we found out how Jesus' preaching began, how he began to call his disciples, how he was casting out demons, healing the sick, cleansing a leper. He even quieted the sea. And his disciples were so amazed. They said, what manner is man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey. And then we get to chapter five. And in chapter five, he was on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter who was sick. But in the midst of that trip, he met a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. So he stopped and he healed that woman. And when he got ready to go to Jairus' house, they came to let him know that Jairus' daughter had died. But he proceeded on. And so at the end of chapter five, we find that he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. So Jesus had been preaching, he had been teaching, he had been healing, casting out demons, raising the dead. And then when we come to chapter six, our lesson for today, we find unbelief and rejection in Nazareth. So we're going to expound on these first six verses in Mark, the sixth chapter. And just before I get started with the verses, I would like to just offer a short prayer. Heavenly Father, I come this hour in the morning. I'm just saying thankful. Lord, I'm so grateful. One more time, you allowed us to come together to learn more about your will and your way for our lives. Father, I pray that you would just open up hearts, understanding, so we could be receptive, creating to us clean hearts and renew within us the right spirit. Bless us in our efforts and whatever we accomplish, Father, we're going to be so careful. We're going to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this blessed opportunity. Okay, verse one says, And he went out from them and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. He went out from them, meaning that he had come from Capernaum. He had been doing a lot of his teaching and ministry in Capernaum. So now he came to his own country. He came back to Nazareth. 
Now, we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but we know little or nothing about the time that he spent there after his birth. We have no account of Jesus from the age of 12 years old to the age of 30 years old, but we do know he was reared in Nazareth by his mother Mary and his earthly father, Joseph. Okay, and he's known as Jesus of Nazareth. All right, Nazareth was just a little small, dusty, kind of like a little nowhere town, and it was like an isolated visit, village. Um, this was this was Jesus' second trip that he had made his second visit uh, to Nazareth. Okay, when he had went to Nazareth the first time, he had a negative reaction on that first trip, and uh, Luke, the fourth chapter, starting at the 18th verse, it tells us about that. When he opened the book and he stood up boldly to deliver from the prophet Isaiah, he started speaking how the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he had anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. And he had sent him to heal the blind, to give sight to the blind and to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captive and the recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those that were bruised and he was to preach the acceptable year of the Lord when he closed the book and gave it to the minister all of the eyes of all of the people were up on him they were in awe they were amazed he had spoke with such power and such authority so he began to let them know that this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears he made a messianic proclamation. He prophesied that I am he. I am the Messiah. So Jesus announces that he was fulfilling the promise that God had given to the prophet Isaiah. So his visit went from astonishment to rage. And in that rage, they ran him out of the synagogue and they wanted to take him to a cliff and throw him over. But some way he passed through the people and going his way, he left. He left out of Nazareth. And so a whole year had passed. And so now he's back in Nazareth a second time and he have his disciples with him. And through my studying and my reading, I found out that the disciples is going to learn a valuable lesson in rejection. And because uh, soon Jesus is going to send them out and they too will be rejected. Okay, and verse two says, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many heard and were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand? The Sabbath day. It was custom to teach on the Sabbath day. It was a key observance for the people of Israel. It was established in the law of Moses. Remember Exodus 20, chapter verse 8, when it said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It was a day of rest. So he was on the Sabbath day, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the synagogue was like a place to assembly. It was an assembly place. It was like our church today. And so what happened during the Babylonian exile, when the people was far away from their homeland, the temple was destroyed. And so the custom of gathering on a Sabbath day began. It began to be a day where they would read the scroll of the prophet or the scroll of the Torah aloud and they would pray together. So this practice became common over time. And it eventually took root in Israel homeland as the Jewish people continued once they got from exile. So many of the people that heard Jesus, they were astonished when they heard him the second time. They were astonished because they were thinking about this little homeboy. They were amazed. His words were so full of power and so full of authority. And so they were so familiar with the humanity of Jesus, it was hard for them to believe in his divinity. And so they couldn't separate the supernatural and the natural, the miraculous and the common the extraordinary and the ordinary. And even in John 1 and 45, 46, say Philip, when Jesus was searching for disciples, say Philip was, uh, came to Nathaniel 
And he told Nathan, he said, we have found him, the one whom Moses in the law and the prophets had wrote about. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, you done found who? What's his name? Where is he from? He said, Jesus of Nazareth. And said, Nathaniel replied, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? His home folks began to question, to begin to question the source of his knowledge. How could he be speaking on the level of a rabbi without any form of training? Where did this wisdom come from? He never attended no special training with the Jewish religious leader. Did he sit at the feet of Gamaliel? What is the source of his teaching and his authority? He didn't hold any degree or no high position in the temple of Jerusalem. They were astonished at his teaching. He spoke as they had never heard a man spoke before. And then they were looking at all the miracles that was wrought by his hands. So two things they did realize. They realized that he had divine wisdom and that he had divine power. And so when you get to verse three, they're going to start questioning his identity. Is this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And are not these his sisters with us? They were offended at him. They began questioning Jesus' identity. Is not this the carpenter? Now they knew Joseph was Jesus' earthly father. And they knew Joseph was a carpenter. And one thing they didn't know, because they grew up where Jesus grew up in Nazareth, they knew that your father, he circumcised you, he taught you the law, and if he had a trade, he taught you that trade. And since Joseph was a carpenter, they knew he had taught Jesus carpentry, and Jesus was a carpenter. But then they're going to mock Jesus and look like they're going to be skeptical, the son of Mary. They also knew that... Um, in Jewish custom, they never acknowledge nobody by their mother's name. You would always use the father's name, not the mother's name. They would recognize the father, but they were trying to be facetious. They were trying to mock Jesus. And, and in the first place, they might have remembered, but they didn't want to own up to it, that Mary did have that virgin birth, that Mary did have the Holy Ghost that impregnated her. So Jesus could be the Messiah, but they don't want to accept that. They're still playing around with their little homeboy, the boy that they grew up with. And so they're not, they're not believing that this is the Messiah. And so they were offended. The problem was they were too familiar with Jesus and they were offended at Jesus. We know your family. We know your mama. We know your daddy. And you're going to tell us you're the Messiah? You're the one we've been looking for? They were offended. They had gotten upset. That's the bottom line. They were really, really upset with Jesus. They were offended. And so the Greek word for offended is scandalized. It means putting something in someone's past to potentially trip them up. Because they could not explain Jesus, that's why they called him their stumbling block. They called Jesus their stumbling block. They were made to stumble because of their unbelief. Now, Isaiah over 700 years ago had prophesied that Jesus would do this very thing, that he would come. Read Isaiah 8 and 14, and it'll tell you, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense. The Lord Jesus is the church. He is that sanctuary for the salvation of those who believe. But he's going to be that stumbling block. He's going to be that fatal stumbling block for those who do not believe. 1 Corinthians 1 and 23 tells us we preach Jesus Christ crucified unto the Jews, he's a stumbling block. Unto the Greek, it's foolishness. They were offended of who Jesus was, the carpenter's son. They could not believe that Jesus was the son of God. And they were at Jesus' baptism. And they heard when Jesus came up how the Lord, the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now in verse two, they were astonished at the doctrines and everything that Jesus was teaching. And when you get to verse three, now they are offended at the person who Jesus really is. So they really didn't know who Jesus was. 
they they couldn't get the image that they had in their mind of Jesus. They 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 were too familiar with him. No one in that time had ever did anything spectacular, had never made no kind of name for themselves, but they had one whose name would ultimately be above every name. Because in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Jesus' name would be highly exalted. His name would be exalted above every name. And the scripture said, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. So how did Jesus respond to this uh, rejection? In verse 4, it said, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. First of all, Jesus make a definite claim that he was a prophet. He's a full speaker for God. And Deuteronomy had already promised that a prophet would come. And then in my study, I went and read in Acts, the third chapter, verses 22 to 24, when they say, Moses truly said unto the fathers, he said, a prophet shall the Lord, our God, raise up unto us. And he said, we better hear whatsoever he have to say. And say, it shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear this prophet will be destroyed. And they say, all of the prophets from Samuel, and all of those that followed him, they told that same message. Jews in Jesus' days, they were certainly aware of the harsh treatment that the prophet got. Through the prophet, God had spoken to the people, but they refused to heed the message. Jesus' experience in his hometown is another instance of such rejection. Jesus just excused it, and he did it like it was just a little common thing, just a little everyday thing. He said, a prophet is not despised anywhere but in his own country. He said, I could go around complete strangers and they would accept me before those who know me would. The saddest part of all of it was, John 7 and 5 said, his own brothers, his own brothers in his own home disbelieved his messianic claim. Verse 5 said, and he could there do no mighty works, saying that, he laid his hand upon a few sick folks and healed them. And he couldn't dare do no mighty works. It's not that he couldn't do no more works. He chose to limit himself because of the response of man's faith, because of their unbelief in him. One thing Jesus is not going to do, he's not going to override the unbelief of the people. Not because he's unable, but because of our unbelief. Unbelief is a moral hindrance. Faith is an important factor of God's power. Jesus' hometown folks' lack of faith denied them of miracles and blessings. So what he did, he laid his hands on a few more folks and he healed a few more, but not many. And because of their unbelief, he dusted his feet because he was rejected. They rejected the truth. And so he dusted his feet and he went on. And verse 6 said, he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Now in verse 2, they were amazed at Jesus, the way he spoke. When we got to verse 3, they were offended because of the person he claimed to be. Now when we get to verse 6, Jesus is amazed at them because of their unbelief. And so he went around the village just teaching. He marveled because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. Look, he marveled at a man, as a man, but as God, nothing was strange to him. Nothing. Jesus was amazed. I remember another time when Jesus marveled, and that was in Luke, the seventh chapter, but he marveled at the centurion belief in him. When you read that story in Luke, the seventh chapter, verses one through 10, you'll find that the centurion had sent for Jesus to come and heal his servant. And as Jesus was on his way, the centurion must have thought about it. And he said, no, you don't have to come to my house because I'm not even worthy. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. But Jesus, you being Jesus, just speak the word. And I know my servant will be healed. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled. He was amazed. 
he looked around at the people and he said unto them, I have not found so great faith, no, not in all Israel. So he marveled at the belief of a centurion who was a Gentile, but he had to marvel at the unbelief of his own hometown folk that did not accept him, that rejected him. So we are called to have faith in God. Faith is a lifelong journey. Faith is powerful. Faith can move mountains, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. But let me just share something with you. Unbelief is powerful also. Unbelief activates divine wrath. Unbelief is a force. It activates divine judgment. The power of unbelief is so great, it extends throughout all eternity. Adam and Eve, unbelief in the word of God, they brought the entire human race into a curse and eternal judgment. John 1 and 10 said, Jesus was in the world and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. Verse 11 said, he came into his own and his own received him not. Verse 12 said, but as many as received him, to them gave he powers to become the son of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 3, 16 through 18. We all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But look at verse 17. It said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18 said, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, that unbeliever, he's condemned already. Why is he condemned? Because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten son of God. So it was unbelief that brought a curse on all humanity, and it is unbelief in the son of God that will send all non-believers to eternal hell. So the doors are not yet closed on such people of today. No place, no group, no person is ever beyond the possibility of repentance. And God always welcomes the repentance. Jesus did not completely allow the unbelief, the doubt, and the lack of cooperation by the people to prevent him from offering effective ministry to others that would receive him. His hometown folks, unbelief, it couldn't stop Jesus. What they said about him couldn't change who he was. Isaiah had already prophesied and said he would be despised and rejected by men. Psalm 118 and 22 said a stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Jesus is that stone that has been rejected. He is the true cornerstone. He is the foundation of the church. They cast him away by their reproaches and by giving him up to be crucified. And then they cast him into a grave and they put a stone to roll up on this stone, which they had rejected, that it might appear no more. They thought they had him, so they thought. They thought for sure they had him. But even then, did not he rose? He rose with all power in his hand and he became the head of the corner. The stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. God sent a living, a precious stone, so rejected to become the head of the corner. The bond was to connect the two walls and keep us together. It's just one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, the whole church, and it's composed of what? Jews and Gentiles. Jesus is that stone that the builders rejected, but he became the chief cornerstone, the head of the church. There will always be naysayers in our lives, but we must not allow the hollow voices of the naysayers to distract us from our di divine direction. We must refuse to allow anything or anybody to prevent us from fulfilling 
our divine calling. God's acceptance is much more important than man's approval. I'll repeat that. God's acceptance is much more important than man's approval. So what are we going to do? We must stay amazed. We must stay amazed. We must stay excited about Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day is just a gift from God. You know, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? I'm going to stay amazed. So let us stay amazed. In the midst of whatever going on, just know, don't you know God is able? He's able, church. He is able. So let everything that has breath, let us just praise the Lord. Wake up in the morning praising God. Throughout the day, praise God. When you go to bed at night, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's another day's journey, and I truly am glad about it. Revelation 2 and 10, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. And in Mark 9 and 23, Jesus said unto them, If thou believe, all things are possible to him that believes. This is our Sunday school for this morning. I've enjoyed teaching. I was just excited to be back among the teachers. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Amen.